Hello. Uh, I should say good day. In case you don't know, uh, my name is John Scott. I'm a descendant of the Ningai people of central Queensland in Australia. And I'm also the senior program officer for traditional knowledge at the United Nations Convention on Biodiversity. Uh, but before I start, distinguished delegates, representatives of North America's indigenous peoples, friends and supporters, I want to start by acknowledging, of course, the elders past and present of the Haudenosaunee League of Nations for allowing us to meet on their traditional lands today. Now, the Mohawk elders from Ganawagi are eager to greet you uh, for a community visit next Monday for those of you who are staying on for our second conference. Uh, but the Mohawk elders regularly open uh, our working group on traditional knowledge uh, which meets every two years in Montreal and we have a, a long relationship with them going back many decades. Uh, uh, their traditional address to open our meetings has always given us a good outcome of our work for Indigenous peoples. And I want to talk a little bit about that now and also to link the importance of the work that you're doing here in the Cicada Network and the conference next week to shaping future national and international policy of relevance to Indigenous peoples, uh, particularly with a focus on conservation and sustainable use. Uh, so the Convention on Biological Diversity, which you may know, is the UN body that's responsible for conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and the equitable sharing of benefits. Now, let me address the role of the Convention in particular uh, uh, for the protection of traditional knowledge. The Convention provides the clearest recognition of the links between traditional knowledge, biodiversity conservation, through the obligations on 196 governments to the Convention to respect, preserve and maintain the knowledge, innovations and practices of Indigenous peoples and local and traditional communities. Now, additionally, uh, uh, this current strategic plan, which finishes next year in 2020, has 20 targets. Target 18 is of particular relevance, and Target 18 states that by 2020, the traditional knowledge, innovations, and practices of indigenous peoples relevant for conservation, sustainable use of biodiversity, their customary sustainable use of biological resources are respected and fully integrated into the implementation of the convention. We'll talk about that a little further. So to assist the parties to implement their obligations under the convention, the governing body, which we call the Conference of the Parties or the COP, has adopted by consensus principles and guidelines for uh, implementation at the national level, which include an extensive set of guidelines and principles uh, adopted under the convention that address traditional knowledge and customary sustainable use of biodiversity. These principles and guidelines are negotiated, agreed to by consensus. Over time, they become minimal standards in customary international law. So many of the guidelines embody and promote the important global priorities for Indigenous peoples, and that is that traditional knowledge is accessed only with the prior and informed consent of the Indigenous knowledge holders, and that its use is based on mutually agreed terms that guarantee an equitable sharing of any benefits that arise from its use. So overall, the guidelines and principles adopted under the convention highlights the need for the effective participation of indigenous peoples in all matters of relevance to us. As such, the guidelines and the principles adopted under the convention for traditional knowledge uh, help to fulfill the obligations uh, envisaged under Article 31 of the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which states that Indigenous peoples have a right to maintain, control and protect their cultural heritage, uh, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. So a crucial issue remains, and that is the implementation of these guidelines and principles at the national and subnational level. And of course, we will be looking at that in detail next week. 
So I'm going to jump now to next week, the North American Conference on Biocultural uh, Diversity, the North American Dialogue. So next week I'm pleased to join with many partners and particularly Cicada, who was uh, uh, the brain behind all of this and the discussion's gone on for more than a year uh, to make sure this event and the following event uh, uh, are useful for Indigenous peoples. So I think the event next week provides us with a unique opportunity to link, link what you do at the local level to the future directions in national and international policy making on conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. The convention itself is in, in an extensive consultation period going up to the governing body in October next year in 2020 in China where it will make uh, decisions about the next 30 year plan for conservation or as I like to say saving life on earth. So that plan will be 2020 to 2050. So as the current strategic plan ends next year, the, the next two years, the period up until the end of the strategic plan, the parties to the convention are now considering the architecture and the elements for the post-2020 global biodiversity framework in order to achieve the convention's goal of humanity living in harmony with nature by 2050. I'd ask you to think for a moment, how old will you be in 2050? I do, for the sake of our children, I do hope that we achieve this vision. Now, so this conference, both this week and next week, provide unique opportunities to further strengthen the role of traditional knowledge and Indigenous peoples in the future work of the convention. So I want to leave you with two main messages today. And that is in the broad consultations on the post-2020 global biodiversity framework, between now and the 15th meeting of the Convention's Conference of the Parties, which happens in October next year, the door is wide open to receiving ideas from Indigenous peoples uh, to propose new elements of work of relevance to Indigenous peoples, as well as new institutional arrangements for your participation in the Convention on Biodiversity. So in our consultations thus far, I see that we have some exciting proposals already on the table from Indigenous peoples who have been following the work of the Convention. Uh, and some of those will be very close to the hearts of people in this room. Uh, a shining light at the moment and a shining light in future will be Indigenous community conservation areas uh, or referred to in my country as Indigenous protected areas. In my country, out of the 17% of the continent which is under protection, the National Protected Areas Estate, Indigenous peoples manage 9% of that which is more than half of the National uh, uh, Protected Areas Estate. So, uh, and uh, I think Canada has the same potential once your land tenure and your claims have been sorted out here to also embrace community conservation and to shine a light on this as a future direction for conservation for this country. So um, as well as the community conservation areas, there's also proposals for the in situ conservation of traditional crops and animals, for local food systems and food security and food sovereignty. All of these are very attractive proposals and there's many more. There's a list of at least 25 areas of work that's been proposed. So, uh, and these have been uh, received from the International Indig Indigenous Forum on Biodiversity, which is the Indigenous Caucus which follows the convention. So I'm also quite uh, uh, want to recognise that Indigenous peoples who follow the CBD officially are observers in the process and they are lobbying extensively for a new stat status and that is a status as partners in the implementation of the convention. So, uh, and they believe that this is crucial for the future of the convention, that Indigenous peoples are not just seen as observers, but that we are actors in the implementation of the convention and achieving its goals and vision. So uh, I think that's an important message from Indigenous peoples. My second and last message is about the importance of biological and cultural diversity, uh, or nature and culture, for ecosystems and community resilience, 
and indeed for healthy transmission, generation and protection of traditional knowledge. So let me talk a moment about our work on nature and culture. From a policy perspective, nature and culture has been artificially separated for too long to the detriment of our work. These policies are never developed in the same room, they're developed in isolation. I believe that nature and culture are inseparable and only recognising their intrinsic value and by addressing them in synergies, can we pave the way forward to achieve the Convention's vision of living in harmony with nature by 2050. So co coherence could be found through the establishment of an international alliance for nature and culture, uh, which is one of the proposals my Executive Secretary, who's an Assistant Secretary General of the UN, has proposed at the Permanent Forum last week that we should have an international alliance for nature and culture made up of agencies, governments, indigenous peoples and civil society and that we should ask the GA to consider launching a decade for nature and culture 2020 to 2030. So an international alliance could be a natural extension of a decade of work between the convention, UNESCO uh, and IUCN, the World Conservation Union, 196 governments and indigenous peoples in understanding the links between biological and cultural diversity. And you know those links. Foremost in my mind, languages, indigenous languages, it's the International Year of Indigenous Languages. But there's traditional knowledge, tangible and intangible cultural heritage uh, and everything else. Uh, so uh, the Alliance could serve as an inclusive multilateral platform for governments, United Nations entities, indigenous peoples, NGOs, academia, faith-based communities to work on issues relevant to nature and culture and to have a robust discussion and provide some possible elements for the consideration of the governing body next year aimed at bringing policy making on nature and culture together in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework. So an international alliance for nature and culture could consider further synergy, uh, strategies to ensure that nature and culture are addressed together in the post-2020 era, including by perhaps calling for a de the decade on nature and culture. Now, as proponents of cultural and biological diversity, indigenous peoples have a, a special role to play in an international alliance for nature and culture. <clears throat> but the purpose of the Alliance is also to invite all cultures, including mainstream culture, to reflect on their relationship with nature, to bring nature and cultures together in the post-2020 era. So my Indigenous brothers and sisters and our friends and supporters, in our vision of humanity living in harmony with nature by 2050, let us create ample space for the interplay of nature and culture, let us create ample space for the transmission, generation and protection of our knowledge and of our culture. Uh, the con contribution of indigenous peoples to human well-being and to the conservation, sustainable use of biodiversity is immeasurable. Now, I look forward to spending time with you over the next week. Uh, to have these important and deep discussions, to hear about what is working and what is not working on the ground for you in your communities, to hear your thoughts on future work and future directions, and we and uh, sorry, uh, sorry, to hear your thoughts on future work and future directions. We need to take this on board if we are to slow down the great sixth extinction crisis which is happening right now on planet Earth and to ensure that humanity uh, does have a sustainable future on this planet. I, uh, recently I was reflecting on the uh, social media and the phenomena of the extinction rebellion. And I don't know if I'm ready to join it and support social disruption for those of you who are not ready to take to the streets, I would ask you to at least join the Alliance for Nature and Culture to follow the CBD and to take practical actions in our daily lives to live in harmony with nature. So uh, maybe I can stop there. 
Uh, I'm very excited uh, over the next week. It's taken a couple of years to realise these events and uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you and I, I do hope most of you will be staying for next week as well. Maybe I could stop and see if there's some questions. Yes. I should add, of course, next week I will be going into a lot of detail on how the convention is reflected in national law through the National Biodiver uh, Action Plan and Biodiversity Strategy, and of course the, the details of how Indigenous peoples can influence that. Uh, but of course for me I already see some uh, shining lights, and I know we have some members of the ICCA consortium here, so I look forward also to working with them to ensure uh, community conservation is on the table. Well, I'm just delighted that uh, there's a, another Scott at the podium and a, and, and, <laughs> and a better Scott than uh, Duncan Campbell Scott, who, was, uh, who <laughs> sullied the name this morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I did you have know, work colleagues told me there were lots of Scots here and they asked me if I was related to any of you. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> <laughs> all I know is that Duncan Campbell Scott is from a, an elite branch of the family that uh, is rather remote from my own. <laughs> Uh, just in, c in case you uh, don't know, uh, I do have a short bio here. Of course, my father was born on a Catholic mission for Aborigines. My grandmother and her brothers and sisters were removed from central Queensland and moved to the Sherberg mission in the uh, 1910s. Uh, I, uh, my father was born on the mission. Uh, I grew up in an urban indigenous area. Uh, and of course my background is Indigenous education and then law and uh, Indigenous law and human rights. Uh, I will show you... Oh, this is a map of Australia you don't see very often. These are our language groups or our tribes. My grandmother's tribe... As uh, many people will know in the room, that during the colonisation period, the process in Australia was to remove people from inland and to put you on the coast, to move people from the coast and put you inland, to sever your connection to country and language and culture. Uh, so in, in the missions were very difficult times. People were uh, physically punished for speaking language or practising their culture. My, uh, 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 my language group in, in Ingai people, we have 300 words left for our language and two songs, which were collected by a linguist in the 1870s, so which is a common story. Out of uh, between five and 700 language groups, Australia has only 30 or 40 languages that are in good shape. Most of these are, uh, well, some are in the Torres Strait, some are in Central Australia. Uh, and of course, the, uh, indigenous languages are often only sp spoken by small groups, maybe 800, 1500 people make up a tribe. And, uh, uh, but what was common traditionally is that uh, my people also were multilingual and understood the language of all the groups that we shared boundaries with. And that's how people communicated across the continent. So, uh, although I have been out of my country for 20 years, I go back, of course, every year with, to my family. And uh, I did, I have a sister here from the Torres Strait. Uh, I did, used to w work in the Torres Strait in the 1980s. So we know some of the same people. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, who will be staying on for next week? Uh, good, we'll have lots of time to talk. The, the International Alliance uh, for Nature and Culture is a challenging uh, uh, vision. It's, a, it's big <laughs> thinking. It, it reminds well, me of maybe a step toward what uh, uh, the anthropologist uh, Bruno Latour has referred to as the new constitution, mm. uh, w which uh, he understands uh, of political ecology in a very particular sense, which uh, is that uh, in the new constitution, there must be voice for all 
forms of life and all uh, life interrelationalities. And mm. that's the challenge that mm. uh, a true uh, uh, international alliance for nature and culture coming exactly. out of indigenous relationalities, exactly. that's, that's the goal to which one would mm. need to aspire. It, it was kind, kind of quite shocking for me to come to this area of biocultural diversity to find out that policies at national and international levels never meet, that they never take each other into account. And uh, my boss reflected last year in a meeting that maybe we, we would have made, we would have advanced closer to our goals if culture had been at the table, but instead we've just had science. Uh, uh, some of the work I do is also with a new body called the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, which goes by the mm. acronym of IPIS. And IPIS is meeting this week in Bonn, and next week there's an Indigenous meeting related to that. And they're actually looking at how do you bring science and traditional knowledge together in respectful ways to create the best possible knowledge base for local ecosystem management. So, uh, and it's a discussion we will pick up next week. How do we bring different knowledge systems together? Because uh, we don't want to be in a position where uh, we're using Western science to validate traditional knowledge. So how do we do this in respectful ways? Uh, so we'll be having this discussion next week, but it's also so going on across the other side of the pond, the Atlantic, uh, in Bonn in Germany. So this, uh, just to let you know, the, these kind of discussions are breaking out all over the place. This is the first North American meeting we've had on this, but we've had one for the Asia Pacific <coughs> two years ago, which brought together 300 people. We also had one for the European region, which brought local communities together, uh, including traditional flower growers from the south of France and uh, local f traditional farmers from Eastern Europe. So uh, the, the idea of nature and culture, biological and cultural diversity being brought together is, I think, an extremely powerful idea and its time has come. We, you know, we can't be developing these policies without a cultural context in future. Thank you.